Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, a key lawmaker describes the challenges ahead as the baby boom generation ages, and a longtime advocate for reforming the Metropolitan Council offers his view as a member of the new task force, plus an up-close look at the Golden Horses. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. A result of the 2023 legislative session was the creation of a task force on aging to identify and develop state resources for an aging population. Recommendations from the group are due January 15th, 2025. Joining me to talk about the priorities of the group is the task force chair, Representative Ginny Cleavorn. Thank you so much for joining me. Shannon, it's great to be with you. What was the impetus for the creation of this task force? So as I've said in committee, this is really a grassroots campaign. Uh, it came from older Minnesotans who said, we are so far behind where we needed to be in the 2030 plan. We need legislative action to bring this issue to the fore. And so with that, Senator Morrison and I worked together. We developed the legislation with members of the community and we brought that forward. And that's Senator Kelly Morrison. Uh, Dr. Joe Gogler from the University of Minnesota's Center for Healthy Aging and Innovation is a member of the task force. At the initial meeting, he noted that there have been many statewide initiatives that have created, as he said, quote, wonderful reports with excellent recommendations. But he went on to say that there's never any follow up to determine metrics of success. Can this task force have a different outcome? Well, that is in fact our intent. Um, there is a massive body of <laughs> white papers, research, information out there. Much of the work that we will be doing, we know needs to be done. Uh, it's educating the public, building the political will to do the work within the community, and shifting how we think about aging. So many people, when we talk about aging, focus solely on skilled nursing and long-term care. That is a part of the work that we need to do, but we have to build the understanding that so many of our older Minnesotans remain vibrant, they remain in community, and they want to go through their twilight years as active members in their community. So how do we make that happen? Uh, Dr. Susan Brower is the state demographer. She. Uh, presented to the group and provided data and graphs that point to an array of challenges that, that are on the horizon as the baby boom generation reaches age 75, when generally speaking, people's needs do become more acute. Mm -hmm. She stated clearly that these challenges are not hypothetical. They are coming. Is it possible, though, for the legislature to act in advance when most often the legislature tends to be a reactive body? Well, I would say, Shannon, that we are reacting. You know, we have already over three quarters of a million people who are 65 and older. We are moving to 1.2 million Minnesotans who will be 65 and over for the foreseeable future. So the question is, um, how do we take the infrastructure that we have and make it better? And we, so I would say it, we are actually reacting. We are not being proactive. The body of research has been there for 30 years. So now how do we implement and how do we build the coalition of state participants that will have the strength to help us figure out how we pay for this as well? And we'll get to the paying for it in just a moment. But before we do, I wanna touch on what you said about people wanting to remain active because a recent headline from the American Psychological Association reads, quote, ageism is one of the last socially acceptable prejudices. Mm -hmm. Considering that the baby boom generation is the largest generation of Americans, and as you said, soon 1.2 people over, 1.2 million people over the age of 65, do our collective views on older Americans, older Minnesotans need to change? Do we need to look at our elders differently? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, we had testimony in committee just this last week about what elder Minnesotans do. They provide the majority of child care or after school care for their children. They do, they are the volunteer workforce that you heard Dr. Gogler talking about in committee. There is so much that they do, whether they're tutoring in our schools, 
whether they're greeting you at your local community store, whether they're providing childcare, they're the volunteers who are driving people to medical appointments, they're the volunteers who are running our elections, uh, or they're the election judges who are paid running our elections. They do so much important work in our community, and everyone, everyone <laughs> deserves equal treatment. And ageism is something that needs to be uh, eliminated. Our uh, older Minnesotans are valuable contributors to our community, and no one should be judged by their numeric age. The Wall Street Journal this week published an article with charts on America's long-term labor crisis, which is expected, the labor force is respected, expected to remain tight for many years. Mm -hmm. Experts cite a combination of baby boom retirements, low birth rates, shifting immigration policies, and changing worker preferences as reasons for this tight market. Mm -hmm. As a state, Minnesota already has a caregiver shortage, and you noted that's a small percentage of what impacts aging people, however, is this a focus of the group because as people you know, do get older, they do require more services, they do need more help, do we have the workforce? We do not, is the short answer. So the question is, what does that workforce look like? How many hours are we going to require people to work and can we pay them livable wages, right? Uh, when you are caring for someone who has physical needs, it is demanding work. Uh, the question is, can we set up an infrastructure system that balances keeping people in their homes with what uh, was described as the light touch, housekeeping, grocery shopping, helping with toileting or dressing or average daily activities for living? Can we keep people in their homes with light assistance coming in for a longer period of time? We are not going to be able to build ourselves enough skilled nursing facilities to care for people. People don't want to go to skilled nursing. They want to remain in community and remain vibrant. So again, this is the conversation that we have to have and then figure out what steps we can take to make these things happen. But long-term care is um, a portion of what we need to talk about, but we need to also be talking about employment. We need to be talking about infrastructure. What does transit look like? In greater Minnesota, we cannot expect an 83-year-old to be driving themselves two and a half hours for a doctor's appointment in a blizzard. That's just not reasonable. So how do we bring health care to the community? Is it done by technology? Is it done by uh, local clinics? These are all things that we'll have to decide. And all of those things do have tax implications. Can you touch on that? Yes, um, I am having those conversations right now with uh, the long-term care community to say, how do we, can we help build a coalition to say, yes, there is a space in here where we know that we could maybe uh, do something together to generate the revenue to cover these costs of investments that we're going to need. But it's also important that we think if we go to the beginning of the drawing board and not wait to the end. So as we are thinking about building new transit, is the transit station we're building age appropriate? Is, uh, is the uh, community center that we're building age appropriate? Are we factoring in and embedding in all of our policies and all of our investments? What does this do as we age? And if we do that on the front end, we save money on the back end. And then building a coalition to say, yes, this may cost a little more in the front, but it will also help you as we generate revenue and keep our economy vibrant, right? So the, um, it's a balance. So just briefly before we go, yes. I assume you're looking at regional differences because the challenges mm -hmm. of greater Minnesota, as you mentioned, transportation, mm -hmm. closeness to medical appointments, et cetera, are different than metro area uh, stressors, which can just be the high cost of living. Are you going to have regional recommendations as well? It is something that we definitely have to consider. In Minnesota, I don't know if we have like eight different regions or nine different regions, so the number's not clear in my head right now. Um, but Every uh, section of our state will have different needs, and we do have to take that into consideration, whether it's the availability of care providers or the distance between where you live from your family. It all must be considered. And 
I would say there most likely will be regional recommendations. Representative Jenny Cleveborn, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you. Shannon, it's great to be with you. Please reach out anytime. Metropolitan Governance Task Force met this week to continue working on possible reforms to the Metropolitan Council. Where the Met Council acts as an operator for Metro, like Metro Transit, um, and then they act as more of a planning organization. And, and my question is, in the role of planning organization, um, under the current structure, do you feel like you have the authority to manage your county? Do your municipalities feel like they have the account, the authority to manage their growth or lack of growth? Uh, and development, or, or do they feel like the Met Council has uh, a, an overrepresentative amount of, of authority? It just doesn't seem to be a balance of what the variety of needs are. And so, do I believe they're heavy handed? Yes, but it's amplified by the resources that then are not provided to support the mandates. I mean, if they're, I, I've People on tab, I say this all the time. I mean, if you're going to force us to take all of this new growth, then please at least give us some money for the infrastructure to support it. You think of the of the land use that's occurring, uh, you know, in parts of the county, the two acre lot land use, and and the way the Met Council is doing things. Is that a concern? Do you think you know? You said the, the largest growth is in counties outside the Met Council. Should we be thinking about sewers or things, or should we just let the let it be the Wild West? I think we still have to look at what the market demands. Uh, the goals are good, but if they are so constrained and so counter to what the market is demanding, you won't achieve your goals. Senator Eric Pratt is a member of the task force, and he now joins me in the studio. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, the Met Council is a regional taxing authority, planning agency, and provider of services like sewage, parks, and transportation in the Twin Cities. Is it fair to say that the size and scope of the Council's oversight and power has grown since it was originally created in 1967? Oh, it absolutely has grown. One of our first meetings, we had an overview of the various stages of Met Council over time as an advisory committee, as more of an oversight uh, body and finally in 1994 actually becoming an operator of certain systems and so uh, the Met Council's uh, scope and authority has grown over the years and the governance model has not kept up with that. It's a great question because not only are we looking at the structure of the Met Council but we're looking at whether or not the scope of the Met Council is appropriate as well and, and that's actually one of the areas I'm most interested in. And this region has changed significantly since 1967. It's changed tremendously since 1967. And, um, you know, one of the things I would say that, you know, there's always been this debate of whether or not we should have a metropolitan council or regional government. And I think it's become clear that in some cases it works very well and maybe in other, in other situations it doesn't. And that's why I'm interested to see and continue the conversation about what should the scope of the Met Council be. Thousands of bills have been introduced over the years that would make changes to the Met Council. In fact, in 2018, you were the chief author of a bipartisan bill that would have removed gubernatorial appointments, staggered terms, increased the size of the council, and eliminated the Transportation Advisory Board. Governor Dayton vetoed the bill. If that bill had become law, what do you think its impact may have been? You know, I think the impact would have been we'd have had a more accountable Met Council. That's one of the complaints that we continue to hear around the representation we have today is that the Met Council is accountable to the, gov to the governor and not to the communities that it serves. And by having locally elected officials on the Met Council, I think we wouldn't be addressing some of these issues. Um, I think we'd have had better oversight over the Southwest light rail construction because it's the cities along that line that would have had a voice at the table, not somebody appointed by the governor. 
Not only have many bills been introduced, but many task forces, blue ribbon panels, and studies have been conducted over the years. This task force uh, recommendations will be due prior to the 2024 legislative session. You don't have a lot of time. Will this work lead to change, or is it just another study? Well, I certainly hope it leads to change. Um, there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of agreement that we'd like to see change. Um, we haven't really dug into what type of change um, we'll be recommending. There's a couple of different ideas, one around having a direct election of Metropolitan Council members, uh, as you mentioned, the other idea is looking at more of a council of governments, um, much like the Denver area has. Um, we have to look at all the various aspects of the Metropolitan Council. Is it going to be a planning organization? Is it going to be an operations organization? Uh, should it continue as our Metropolitan Planning Organization for federal funds? All of these come into play, but even as you listen to the committee hearings, you're hearing about some of the uh, frustration in how resources are being allocated. We had a discussion today uh, how uh, we were allocating funds to housing that were more expensive than it would have been had we put them in another area, and yet the Met Council funded the more expensive uh, project. And so looking at it and making sure that we have a body that is truly representative of the region and truly representative of the communities within the region, I think are going to be crucial. And then as I mentioned before, what's the appropriate scope? Should there be some functions that we put inside the Met Council that need to be moved into other areas? Multiple lawmakers from both sides of the aisle have said, as you just, as you just indicated, the Met Council needs to be more accountable and it needs to provide more transparency. So Senate Transportation Chair Scott Dibble's bill to make the Met Council an elected body rather than how it is currently uh, con uh, constituted is what resulted in this task force in the first place, in part because city mayors objected to, to that. Minnetonka Mayor Brad Wearsome feared that an elected body could become paralyzed and fractured. Is that a valid concern if everyone is elected that it could just get mired in politics? Why well, that is a big concern is is especially in today's political realm, um, we become more divided. We become uh, we're, we're going into our own camps and and a couple of my fears and, and Representative Kozik has brought this up a couple of times. How much money goes into an election, say in Portland, where they do the, the direct election? We're talking two hundred and fifty thousand dollar campaigns. Uh, who's going to be backing those campaigns? We've seen uh, politicization of non-partisan races in school boards and city councils already, not just in Minneapolis, but now out in the suburbs as well. Um, we want a Met Council that is not focused on politics, that's focused on the needs of the region and the needs of our community. While it is true that the handling of the Southwest Light Rail project has been the impetus for taking another look at the Metropolitan Council, it's also true that in 2016 the Met Transit was honored, Metro Transit was honored as the transit system of the year by the American Public Transportation Association. So did something change from 2016 to the present? I don't think so. Um, there have been, there, I, there have been some changes, I think more societally as we've seen uh, more violence on some of our uh, metro transit lines, particularly, you know, we've had um, uh, drivers of, 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 the, of the light rail talk to us about the things that they encounter every day and bus drivers who are being attacked. Those are things that you didn't hear about 10 years ago. Um, and that's not to say that it's not operating well. But one of my concerns is, does the Met Council, as the metropolitan planning organization that gets federal funding and decides which projects are a priority, and being the operator of metropolitan transit, cause a conflict of interest to where more money is going into those projects versus, as representative, former representative, now Commissioner Holberg talked about today, making sure we have the infrastructure to manage the growth. Uh, finally, what is the ideal mix in your view? Is it a combination of elected and appointed officials? 
do you already know kind of what you want to see, or are you just really keeping an open mind as this uh, task force continues to work? I'm really trying to keep an open mind. I'm trying to listen to all, uh, to all sides. I mean, certainly, um, I had the bill in 2018, and, and uh, when you have a bill of that magnitude, um, you become very passionate about it. And so I'll admit that I came into this task force with a bias. But I'm also trying to stay open, knowing that if we are really going to make an effective change, we're going to have to find some level of compromise along the way. Senator Eric Pratt, it's always a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. The iconic golden horses atop the Minnesota State Capitol represent the aspirations of the state at the turn of the 20th century. The sculpture requires ongoing efforts to maintain its seemingly delicate beauty. One of the most remarkable features of the Minnesota State Capitol is the quadriga, also known as the golden horses. What does it symbolize? It's called the progress of the state. That's its official title, and it really represents the idea of Minnesota's arrival as a very prosperous and progressive and wealthy state. So when you look at the symbolism, um, it's a large chariot being pulled by four horses, and each of the horses represent powers of nature. So you have earth, wind, fire, and water. There are two women holding the bridles, and so they represent agriculture and industry, and together that represents civilization. So instead of just having the chariot running forward out of control, you have these women holding the bridles so they can use the powers of nature. So earth, you can use that for agriculture and you can use the water for water power as they were in 1900 for the waterfalls at St. Anthony to produce all those flower uh, barrels and flour that was supplied all over the world. And so now what you have is this state that's always progressing, moving forward, and because of that progress you have prosperity. And so the man on top represents prosperity. So he has a horn of plenty in one arm that has produce, corn, wheat, everything that we produce in the state. The other hand, he has a standard that says Minnesota on it. How did this come to be a part of the state capitol? What was Cass Gilbert's inspiration? This was really a, a something not unique uh, to the Minnesota state capitol. Uh, as many young architects and uh, Politicians, citizens all over the United States flocked to the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. That was often called the White City because they're trying to recreate these Italian Renaissance buildings which were made of white marble back in Italy in the, in the Renaissance period. So they, uh, as a young architect, Gilbert saw a statue very similar to this one done by the same artist, Daniel Chester French. He, he saw that at the World's Fair and so like any young architect, he's putting seeds of ideas into his mind and so when he was given this commission he thought that would be a very appropriate symbol of progress that he could put onto our state capital. So this is all part of the original design but it was really influenced by not only the World's Fair but this was something that you might have seen in Europe too and he did travel through Europe as a young man as well. To your knowledge are there any other state capitals that have such a prominent feature like our quadriga? No, that we're the only state capital that does have a prominent quadriga statuary like this. There, I believe Pennsylvania was another state that had looked at doing that, and so uh, that never did happen. So we have that distinction of being the one and only state capital with this quadriga or this large four-horse statuary group. Now, you mentioned gold leaf, and I understand that, that all of the goldness on that is from gold leaf, and our Minnesota climate is, is not friendly to such delicacy. So how often does it have to be redone, and what's the process, and when was it last redone? Yeah, it's about every 10 years you have to reapply a new layer of gold leaf. And what happens is, and in particular with this statue, it's, it's a, a copper statue. So the horses, the figures are all hollow, hammered copper sheets and uh, the wheels and the chariot are made of sheet metal. And so what they do is they put a, an adhesive, first they put a primer on top of the copper and then they put an adhesive, which is called a sizing, and then they apply the gold leaf to that sizing and that's how it, it fixes itself to the statue. But a, as you get, you know, dust storms, the, you know, there's abrasion that takes place, hail will uh, nick and chip away some of that gold leaf. So. Um, every 20 years you pretty much have to replace that gold leaf. And what we've done in the past is we have had a conservator come here every year to do some touch-up as needed. But it's uh, you know, one of those things that's a, a pretty important thing to do because you, there's so much of the 
artisanship that's involved, so you want to you know, do the best job possible. In the 1940s it was done, in 1979 it was done. 1994, uh, it was actually physically taken off the roof for a complete restoration. And so they uh, took apart every statue, put new support systems inside the horses and the man and the women, uh, statues and so forth. And then it came back in 1995, and then recently with the, the capital restoration, they had to repair the roof underneath where the statuary sits. And so that came down this, uh, in 2016, and then once again had a new layer of gold leaf applied to it. So once uh, again, we're seeing it pretty much as it would have appeared when it was first here in 1906. How popular is the quadriga on the Minnesota State Historical Society tours? It's uh, always one of the big questions we get at the information center is, are we going to see the horses or can I see the gold horses? And it's uh, something, a staple that we do for every tour. So on a beautiful summer day, spring, fall day, uh, we take every tour group up here to see that. And it's, and, and as we mentioned, it's an iconic image and it's something that when you see it up close, it really is pretty pretty substantial. It's a lot larger than you see from below and it really is impressive to see that beautiful gold leaf especially with the sun hitting it and really makes it shine and really give you a sense of the power and majesty of that statuary. For over two decades, the Minnesota Historical Society has offered the shadows and spirits of the state capitol tour. What will guests encounter on this tour? What we do is we recreate the historic lighting in the building as if you're walking into it for the first time in, early, in the early 1900s. And as you walk through these shadowy environs, you run into historical spirits or characters that would have been part of the stories of Minnesota's capital. On this tour, which spirits will guests encounter? Uh, there's a variety of different people from the building's past. For instance, Judson Bishop is a Civil War veteran who will tell his stories about his war experiences, and that's based upon those beautiful paintings of Civil War regiments uh, in the governor's reception room. We'll see uh, Clara Uland, who's a woman suffragist. Uh, she's talking about the right for women to vote and that, that march to getting that right eventually. And also in the Supreme Court, uh, where we're standing right now, we have the artist appears, and that's John Lafarge. She's the one who did these four murals that tell you the evolution, the changes of law throughout time. Does the tour cover the entire Capitol? It covers a lot of the different spaces that you would see on any regular tour. So we visit the rotunda, that's where the tour begins. Go to the governor's reception room, go to the Senate, the House Gallery, you get to see the chamber kind of from the bird's eye view. And then we come to the Supreme Court. What kind of feedback have you gotten over the years from people who've experienced this tour? Yeah, it's always very positive because you can come during the day to see our regular tours, and so you get one perspective of the building, but when you recreate the historic lighting, it really gives you a sense of what it would have looked like here 100 years ago. And uh, I think people are just thrilled to see these different stories being told, and it's really just a, a really fun way to look at the Capitol in a different light. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.